Seen a chain unbroken, words of a prayer unspoken, invisible hands reaching through time. We each have a piece of the story, each have a share in the glory, and a chance to pass it along for those who remain. Thanks in the chain. This is Marjan Love, and this is Marjan's Musings. And today's show was a tough one to come up with a name for. You've heard of AA, the Alcoholics Anonymous, and you've heard of AAA, the American Automobile Association. Well, today's show, I think, is going to be the quadruple A. Audacity avarice, anxiety, and angina. I had a kind of crazy month. I wound up dealing with four different deaths. I was singing at a funeral and it was for a friend of mine. And it's someone that I've known for like eight years and we're together like twice a week. And I was singing at this funeral with 200 plus people at it, realizing I would never sing with her again. And I started experiencing this weird tightness in my chest. And it got worse, and it got worse. And then it went up my neck and into my jaw. And the next day, we had normal Sunday service. And I found out another member of our church had died. A sweet, funny guy that I really liked. Now, we weren't really close. We were more like acquaintances, but still, and that whole sensation came back, but this time it came back hard. Now, our minister, Reverend Derek Van Goulden, he used to go and take care of, you know, pulmonary patients. And I said to him, hey, Rev, do you know a good differential diagnosis between anxiety and angina? And he said to me, well, uh, tell me what's going on. And I did. And he turned around and looked at my husband and goes, so you're taking her to the emergency room right now? So Kevin and I had one of these like spouse conversations in the car. And I said, listen, you know, this is uncomfortable. I'm not like <gasps> gasping for breath and like, oh my God. It was just miserable. And where it was, because I'm an occupational therapist and I've worked in healthcare for 27 years, I was like, this doesn't sound good. And I have a special medication. It's called nitroglycerin. And they give you these little tiny white tablets that uh, oldsters might remember. Saccharin used to come in these little white tablets. Well, these are even smaller than those. And you melt them under your tongue. And if you have angina, like I did, it goes away and instead you get this savage headache. Well, the little vials that the nitroglycerin comes in have 25 pills in them. And my doctor, Dr. Tom Pierce, gave me a vial, I don't know, about a year ago because something had come up and I had gotten anxious and upset and this had started. Well, in those days, in order for me to get that kind of sensation, I'd have to be in like a near car crash. Like it'd have to be something that really scared or upset me. And now that I'm getting a little older, it's happening more frequently. And what made me anxious enough to talk to the minister was that if I took one nitro in the old days, it would go away. 
And now one nitro, it got better, but it didn't go away. <laughs> so my husband and I do this compromise and we wind up at the Leahy Prompt Care next to Marshall's and Market Basket. The next thing I know, I'm in an ambulance. I'm having an IV stuck in me. I'm having an EKG put on me. I'm having a blood glucose blood draw done. I have three men working on me all at once. By the time I made it into the emergency room, my blood pressure was in a stratosphere. So they take my blood pressure, they look at it like it's really wicked high. Now this sensation is like getting pretty serious. And the next thing I know, I have this huge, I mean like somewhere between a quart and a liter of nitroglycerin in a thick glass bottle in an IV into one hand and then heparin, which is a blood thinner, in an IV in the other hand. And my husband is the color of putty. And I realized that he's scared out of his mind when my son walks into the emergency room. Hi, mom. How's it going? And my son looks at the cardiac monitor and the IVs sticking out of each of my hand. And my son's pallor sets in and he gets about the same color as my husband. I'm lying there thinking, this is ridiculous. Well, it wasn't totally ridiculous. It was like, hmm. They did the EKG and because the EKG at the prompt care showed an odd little something that the young physician was not familiar with, she called the ambulance and told them and they did another EKG in the ambulance. And again, this odd little something. And then we're in the ER and they do another one and that odd little something is there. <laughs> and I had this kind of wonderful experience. I met the son of a friend of mine doing another EKG, except this one did your legs and your arms. And again, there's this odd little something. So the next thing I know, I am the resident of the last room at Addison Gilbert. I took the last bed, which left me feeling really guilty because I didn't feel all that sick. You know, I could get up and walk the IV pole to the bathroom, which I needed to do because one of those two things must have acted like a diuretic or else having IV liquids pumped into both hands um, was setting off my bladder. But I had to get up every hour and run to the bathroom carrying this pole. And it made me think of the movie Something's Gotta Give with uh, Jack Nicholson dancing around in a Johnny with his hiney sticking out with his IV pole in the hallway. That was probably the only humor. You know, by the time Dr. Arsinian discharged me the following day, I had had nine venipunctures and seven blood glucoses, and I don't know how many tubes of blood taken. And at one point they were trying to take blood and they weren't getting any. And I'm like, you know, the last time I ate was eight o'clock this morning and I've had one four ounce cup of water to take pills at the prompt care. So this guy comes in, and I'm not sure if he's from Jamaica or where he's from, but he had that sort of Creole patois and this sort of droll sense of humor, and he managed to get me a turkey dinner with squash and stuff, and I finally got to eat. And I'm looking at my husband, and he hasn't eaten either. And I'm like, you know, you need to go downstairs and get yourself some food. So he does, and then he comes back, and he's there holding my hand. It was a strange sensation to be so vulnerable, lying in bed, 
holding my husband's hand with this odd, weird thing, two big IVs, and it still isn't totally gone. Well, the little blip on the EKG, I think, is because when I was a little kid, I had an illness known as scarlet fever. I was uh, so sick. How sick was I? Fever of 106. Fever so bad that my molars didn't form right in my mouth. And I've got a whole mouthful of gold because the enamel didn't form on my teeth properly. And so they decayed really quickly, especially since I used to drink a lot of Coca-Cola and put sugar in my coffee. But it was really kind of eerie. You know, to be in this situation where Dr. Arsinian said, listen, we're doing these blood tests for troponin. If you give me three negative troponin blood tests, it means that you haven't suffered a heart attack and you'll get to go home. But if these troponin come in positive, then tomorrow morning we're going to do a cardiac catheterization. That's some scary stuff there. They go in and, you know, check out your heart with internal to your blood vessels, cameras and stuff. I was like, whoo. And then if they find blockages, they do an angioplasty where they squish the cholesterol that's blocking your blood vessel into the blood vessel wall and if all goes well you have an opened up blood vessel and if it's gooey enough in there and i ate plenty of junk food and sugar in my life could be pretty gooey they would have to put a little spring in there to hold it open called a stint now my dad had open heart surgery and it was called a cabbage bypass surgery and later on he had a stent put in and later on he had to have another stent put in and my auntie had stents put in and my grandpa died on my 11th birthday of a myocardial infarct which is a fancy way of saying a heart attack and my mom her death certificate read coronary insufficiency so this wasn't like you know, the little boy that cried wolf. This was like maybe something quite serious. But it turned out that when I was home coping with the side effects of these two IVs, like I don't know if any of you have ever been so drunk that when you lay down in your bed the entire room spins around. I had that for a couple of days. I was thinking back on the experience and the one part of it that I thought was kind of fun was at 4.45 in the morning, this chipper little sweetie comes into the room and she goes, if I get this blood, do I get like a star or, you know, an accolade? Because four different people had tried to get blood and they could not get blood out of me. And in between there, a phlebotomist had come up and stuck me four times and wasn't able. But I said to the nurse, I said, would you please give me a pitcher of water? They keep wanting to draw blood. I think I'm dehydrated. So I drank an entire pitcher of water so that when this little honey comes in the room and she says, so how do you like your stay here at the Addison Radisson? <laughs> and I had never heard that before. And I thought, oh my goodness. And the poor lady next to me was a groaner. Oh my God. Oh my God. And she was partly deaf. And she was like anxious and hyperactive. She left her hearing aids home and she had the TV on full blast. I'm there trying to sleep. They finally made her turn it off at 1130 at night. And uh, she turned it back on at 4.45 in the morning. And they had come in with a cart four times for her and three times for me. I was like, oh, 
Don't expect to sleep if you ever wind up at the hospital. But I was blessed. I got to go home. It was kind of eerie for me, though. They didn't have any certified nurse assistants on that night. They had either all called in sick or something. That was why I didn't get my water. I didn't get a basin to wash up with. I didn't get, you know, the little hospital socks with the no skid rubber bottoms or the little lotion deodorant and stuff. There were no CNAs on. And two in the morning when I'm texting my husband going, could you please rescue me, get me out of here. They keep sticking me and they can't get any blood. My nurse finally got to come in and see me. And I wound up crying to her about all this anxiety I had suffered for the loss of my friends. And it must be like an issue for a lot of people other than just me because the First Congregational Church of Rockport is going to be doing a Creating Your Final Chapter, Facing Death and Finding Peace. It's going to happen Tuesday, February the 5th through March 12th from 10 to 12 noon in the Morgan Room. It's going to be run by the Reverend Sue Cola Arsenal. I think I'm going to go. And I don't think you have to be a member of the church. I think you'd be welcome from the community if you're in a situation where you're realizing you're winding down. You know, this is your last lap. You don't know whether you're going to be here for five years or 15, but you're certainly not going to be here for 50. Come on down and join us. First Congregational Church, Tuesday mornings for a while. You know, it's freezing. I didn't bother to decorate the set today because my stairs are sheet ice, and I had to rock my car to get it moving enough to get it out of my driveway. So, I was kind of fascinated that the International Women's Writing Guild sent me a thing for their summer conference in Allentown at the Muhlenberg College. And I'm looking at this thing and I have to decide by January 31st whether or not I want to go if I want to save $100. I don't know about you, but Christmas is not that long ago. Mrs. Claus is a little tapped out right now, looking at $1,400 for a week to live in a dorm room and write with people. I'm ambivalent. I don't know if I want to go, and I don't like the fact that I only have the next week and a couple of days to make up my mind timelines, you know. I've read to you before from uh, the Daily Word and Unity sent me this thing about fasting and feasting. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've lost quite a bit of weight. But I'm also at a plateau. Have been for months. It's really frustrating. You know, you weigh and measure your food and you do your exercises the way you're supposed to and then the scale doesn't move. This book, A Mindful Day by David Dillard Wright, has some points that I thought I would share with you. Personal health goals. I do not force myself to conform to an idealized body image. I form a picture of health that is unique to me alone, and I make that my goal. And he goes on to talk about how we're media blitzed by the few perfect bodies that are out there. And then we get this distorted perception that we're supposed to look like these supermodels. 
And on the very next page, he talks about care versus deprivation. I give my body the things that it needs to be well. I do not treat it harshly, but gently guide it into better patterns. And the first line he has in the paragraph is, when most people begin to lead a healthier lifestyle, often the first thing they do is stop eating all the foods they really like. The mind, of course, immediately rebels and starts conjuring thoughts of forbidden foods. And then it, he talks about how the diet can fall apart. Well, I made a Christmas resolution last year. And I joined the Rockport Inn and Suites pool. And this year, since I lost 40 pounds last year, I decided I'd do it again. Even though I haven't lost any more weight in the last several months. I look in a full length mirror in the buff and this is like a scary thing at 66. And even though I now can fit in a size 16 clothing, I don't look like I looked when I went from a size 14 to a size 16 in my 30s. As you lose weight, your skin doesn't contract as quickly as you would wish. And you wind up saggy and baggy, and not just in your double chin, but other places. And you look in the mirror and you go, oh boy. So I decided that since I had this scare at the hospital and all, and I was still having this weird sensation, and I didn't want to eat nitroglycerins every day, and there's a protocol with that. You take one, and five minutes later, if you're not better, you take another one. And the hospital says, at that point, you call 911, and my doctor says, nah, we usually do three. So by the third nitroglycerin, you call 911. I'm thinking, I already took a trip in the ambulance. I don't want to do that again. And I had to really kind of get a grip on myself. Is this anxiety? So I did my meditation and I did my deep breathing. It was still there. And my doctor, between the stomach bug that gave everybody the raging trots and the flu, where no wonder that lady next to me was groaning. When that hit me, I was laying in bed with the joints going, oh, oh, yeah, I kind of got it. Like, oh my God, oh my God. The pain was pretty intense. I'm like, this influenza this year was a bear. But this weird sensation thing that comes and goes did not resolve. So I went to my chiropractor. He's wonderful. And he says to me, well, sweetheart, you're all out of alignment. Where is this? And he goes, oh, OK. And then he feels around and he gets a steel rod that he heated up and puts like lubricant stuff and he's kind of working on you with a steel rod. And then he starts manipulating my skull on the top of my spine. The very two top vertebrae, that's our heat coming on, it's eight degrees outside, so I'm kind of glad. Sorry about the rumble. Anyway, there's two vertebrae right under your skull. The atlas that holds up the world and the axis that your skull turns on, and he adjusted those so that my head was on straight. And within minutes, spasms in my neck and chest. He said it was trapezius sternocleidomastoid, which they shortened to S 
SCM, the SCM and scalenes all stop spasming. But Dr. Arsinian said to me that sometimes your emotions can bring on cardiac issues. If you have a labile response to your emotions, like I do, if I get scared, my, my chest tightens and things tighten up, that you can actually, I don't know if you've ever heard the old expression, you were scared to death, but you can literally be frightened so bad that you go into a heart attack. So I'm still dealing with that. And in the introduction to the show, I talked to you about audacity and avarice. I got a statement from the Cape Ann Savings Bank. I got aggravated. Let me read this to you because it's in lawyeries. This is a substitute for the 2018 form 5498. IRA contribution information, IRA individual retirement account. So when I was working, I put money aside and I saved this money for my retirement. It is for your records only. The information on lines 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 10 is furnished to the Internal Revenue Service. C4 Form 1040 instructions for proper reporting of contributions and rollover deposits. This is the part that brought on this weird chest thing. The fair market value, FMV, of your plan is as of year end. If a decedent is shown as the participant, the fair market value is zero. Let me read that again because it's not written in English. If a decedent is shown as the participant, the fair market value is zero. So if I had died, in the ambulance or the emergency room or up in the last room at the Addison Radisson, the savings plan I contributed to for years would be worth nothing? Wait a minute, excuse me. When I put that in there, I had two beneficiaries, my husband and my son. Why don't they get the money I saved? So I have to go down to Cape Ann Savings Bank and find out what is going on. It says the executor or administrator of the decedent's estate may request a date of death valuation from the financial institution. For information about IRAs, see publication 590, Individual Retirement Arrangements. So they refer you to these government documents, and I'm thinking, you know, with this president initiated for the first time ever government shutdown that is now starting its second month where people have been enslaved. You must report to work and we're not paying you. And people who have been furloughed, you are now locked out of your job and you are not being paid. <laughs> Do you see steam coming out of my ears? Because you should. How angry am I? This is public access, so I am not allowed to use expletives. But I'll tell you, I have two words for this POTUS, and they are not happy birthday. And then, in the middle of all this angst, because I don't know if you remember, but I started this show. The very first episode was when the Tea Party shut down the government. I felt it was un 
unconscionable to shut down the federal government because you're in a spiteful mood. Or in this case, because you want to put a fifth century solution to a global warming initiated global migration problem. I know when I become the most angry is when I am afraid. If three quarters of the world's population live in low-lying coastal areas and sea levels are predicted to rise, from a process that we can slow down and maybe reverse over time, but we can't stop. The weather machine is like a huge ship on the ocean that's moving at how many knots, and some idiot tries to cross the bow and stalls out. Guess what? They're getting hit. That ship does not have brakes. Well, neither does the environment. You have to alter it gradually by less plastic in the ocean, less burning of coal, less burning of gasoline, cleaner fuels. But right now we're experiencing wildfires in California and droughts in the Midwest cattle country and all over the globe. There are these huge changes that are making arable land into desert or arable land into swamp. Arable land is where you grow your food According to some estimates, 86% of all agricultural land is already in production. And at least in the United States, it's pushed into hyperdrive with chemicals, fertilizers, herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, that over time destroy the soil. Yes, we have a bumper crop this year, but 10 years from now, what will that crop be like? The Native Americans have an expression that before you make any serious decision, you have to think forward seven generations. How will it affect people 140, 150 years from now? I don't think we have that kind of wisdom running the country. And I was feeling really disturbed and down. You know, I'm inundated with the radio and the TV of all the angst that this partial government shutdown is causing. And I went to see Joe Jenks. Hmm. Boy, did he uplift my spirits. He gave me a memory jolt. I have five of his CDs. I'm going to quote to you from the CD book for the forgotten. I'm a stranger in this land. Do you remember the year the famine fell and everything you had was turned to one long living hell? So you gathered up the children and the little that you had, and you came into this country as a stranger. Now those who flee from hunger and those who run from war are still struggling by the millions to reach this country's shore. But before you start to judge them, remember who you are. And remember that you came here as a stranger. Every white or black face you see in this country came here as a stranger. The people of copper complexion, piel carnela, the people in South America would say, the Native Americans, they were here first. 
they lived here and they'd been here for time out of mind. When you ask Native American elders, when did you come? They will tell you, we were always here. We've always been here. So everybody else, everybody else came here as a stranger. But I think this idea of building a wall, as naive as it may seem, is this person's attempt to stop the tide of immigration from inundating the country. There are only so many unemployed people any community can absorb before the entire community becomes non-viable. There's this expression in South America that when visitors come, don't worry, don't worry, we'll put more water in the soup. But there comes a point when the soup is so watery that there isn't enough nutrition. And I think what's going on is this person's attempt at five billion plus dollars to prevent people from South America and Mexico from coming into the United States. People have been coming since the Vikings. I don't have a ready answer. You know, if three quarters of the world's eight billion people need to move, where are they moving to? I think with five billion dollars, you might be able to do a water reclamation project and create fresh water and pump it into the Ugalala Aquifer. The below ground water that's been tapped by wells for years and years and years, and I'm talking industrial wells shooting tens of thousands of gallons a year onto irrigated crops which irrigation over time salinates the soil. My husband saw that in Iraq. He says, at night, under the moon, you see the surface of the land glitter from the salt. You know, our government was conceived of as of the people, by the people, and for the people because potentates in the form of kings and emperors and dictators and warlords had ruled the world. And the working people were so poor that they died in plagues and famines. I think this shutdown of our government isn't anything actually new. I think it's an age-old problem of capital versus labor. But in antique times, you know, in the antiquarian times, there were two classes, the educated wealthy and the working poor. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that we had a middle class, a merchant class, an educated middle ground. We need those people. Because when unions fight management, They're on opposite ends of a great divide. Management wants to use labor and raw materials to make as much money as possible. Labor is willing to work, but they need a living wage and they'd like to have a retirement. And God forbid they die in the ER or the operating room or the ambulance like my grandfather did. 
They want to be able to pass on savings to their children as an inheritance because they worked for it and they want to own it and they want to keep it. Joe did other songs that really touched me, like Running Down the Road. Running down the road, so many years been running down the road, running down the road, running down the road to freedom. And he says, sister and mother and father and brother and stranger, don't pass me by. Take my hand and run down the road. We're running down the road to freedom. Well, what's the freedom? Freedom from want. Freedom from fear. Freedom from hunger. Freedom from need. Do you remember when I did the Norman Rockwell show and I showed you the four freedoms that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had? That was a different kind of government. It was a big government, and not everybody agreed with it, but he was able to collect taxes and use those taxes to put the American people to work building aquifers and infrastructure and roads and artists painting murals in post offices and public buildings. I know the tax burden's high. And that's not counting the state of Massachusetts or Social Security. I wonder how we're going to fare. Are we going to be able to collect our Social Security? Like, what's the goal of this shutdown? To prevent impeachment? Each have a piece of the story, each have a, a share in the glory, and a chance to pass it along for those who remain. Links in the chain. In one of the CDs that Joe sells, he talks about that there are people who will buy a factory just to shut it down. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the hostile takeovers of the 1980s and 1990s where big money came in and bought factories in factory towns, bled off the capital, put all the people out of work and shut the factory so that the entire town's economy collapsed. That should be illegal. Federal marshals should come get those people and lock them in jail. And the reason that I mention the educated middle class, of which I am a member, I have a baccalaureate, I have a master's degree. There are people in my generation with doctoral degrees. And some of them are in economics, and some of them are in environmental sciences. We could be the bridge between capital and labor so that we produce what is needed. What do people need? I don't think they need six homes and a yacht. I don't know that every family needs two or three cars. I think we need to establish our priorities. What do we as human beings need to be safe, to be well fed, to be clothed, to be housed, to have community, to have creative outlets? I wish we could take a proactive approach to this impending crisis. I don't know that we're in the situation of labor. 
versus capital. It's sort of like labor is one unified body and capital is a human being rather than rich people with a lot of money. In one of his CDs, Rise is One, Joe Jenkins does a thing that was written by Woody Guthrie back in 1961. It's called Deportees. Is this the best way we can grow your good fruit? To fall like dried leaves, to rot on your topsoil, to be known by no name except deportees. It dealt with the fact that migrant workers who were desperate for money would work in conditions that Americans would not tolerate. I wonder how much, you know, we're going to tolerate. I was thinking about lockouts. You know, if you shut the government down, what is your role as president? Do you have a role? Are you necessary? Are you a vital service if you've shut the government down? Joe does a song in The Candle and the Flame about when he nearly drowned on a retreat. I feel the current raging round me. Try to summon up my strength once more. I am weary on this journey, afraid I will not reach that distant shore. I cry for help, feel like I'm sinking. There is no one near me I can see. But there you are in the water with me. You take my hand and guide me graciously. He's talking about a woman who came out to help him and took his hand but did not let him pull her under the water. And the chorus to the song goes, Will you come with me on this journey? With every breath we take, keep reaching for the dawn. I know alone that I will falter, but with a good friend near me, I will carry on. I think we need to stand together, but we can't do it the way it was done in the 1800s with the Union Wars. That's something that if you're a history buff, look at some of that footage capitalists, from which we get capitalism, were the wealthy. And the way the banking and industrial institutions were set up, the poor stayed poor and the rich got richer, way richer. We've got that going on now. There are estimates that between 3 and 1% of the population of the United States own 80 or even more, 80% of the wealth. And the poorest 20% of the population is saddled with the most debt. In The Forgotten, there's a song that struck me personally because my grandmother used to work in a mill. The title is Shuttle and Loom. Shuttle and loom, bobbin and frame, sometimes I don't even know my own name. What in the world is a woman to do when all that she's got is her shuttle and loom? Shuttle and loom. You know, when we think of the union riots, you know, the labor riots, we typically think of men outside protesting and carrying placards. And if we think hard, we see thugs hired 
by management with billy clubs and guns and knives and, you know, bloody mayhem breaks out. But there were a lot of women who worked in the Industrial Revolution making clothing. Look for the union label. Why? Because those women had enough money to feed their children and pay their rent. I don't know if you remember the building collapse in Bangladesh where the women working in sweatshop situation had the structure they were working in cave in on them and crush them. Most of the people who work low-level government jobs are Democrats. Not all of them. Quite a few of them. The nation elected a Democratic House of Representatives. And the president, pretending that it was about the wall, shut down the government so that the House of Representatives could not represent the people. If that's not obstruction, I don't know what is. The people spoke. The people voted. They voted in Democrats into the House of Representatives, and now the government is closed with an immovable object and unrestrainable force. I'm not giving in on this wall. I don't think that Donald Trump ever looked at the old castles in Europe. They had big, sturdy stone walls. And if you look at them, they're in ruins. Why? Catapults, trebuchets, and later, cannon. I mean, you build that wall, and I get myself a bazooka, and I can blow a hole in it. Not that I would. I mean, I'm not above protest. I tend to be someone that wants compromise rather than violence negotiation, but I'll tell you what, you leave people in a situation where their children are starving and you will foment revolution. Think of the French kings. And when people are wounded and shunned, and I think that's a big part of it. The condescension, the hatred, the misplaced anger. When people are subjected to that sort of abuse, they pull out the guillotine. We need to sort this out. And we need to do it as Americans, not as paranoid, creepy people that will injure and kill others to get our own way. We can think of positive solutions to these issues. There's an entire educated middle class ready, willing, and able to help money and labor come together in a positive way that benefits all people. We just need to have the will to do it. Sorry about the soapbox. Remember a time when chimneys rose so tall over every crossroads town. There were jobs for one and all. The politicians couldn't wait to shake each calloused hand. 
by the midnight factory gate Praising the working woman and man Like a house long neglected Our lives have fallen away Those who line their pockets with our votes Have nothing helpful to do or say No, it's take from this and give to that And bleed the cupboard bare They spit the future in our face Leave us hanging by a prayer Who will speak for, speak for me? Who will speak for, speak for you? Who will stand for, stand for me? Who will stand for, stand for you? Like a dream drowned in silence We are prisoners of our fears While those who left us dangling Hold steady jobs all year You can shake their hand or shake your fist But time will not be stayed Like factories gone to ruin Like shadows on parade Who will speak for, speak for me? Who will speak for, speak for you? Who will stand for, stand for me? Who will stand for, stand for you? You will stand for, stand for me. I will stand for, stand for you.